Hello, nature lovers, and welcome for another exciting uh, episode of Environmental Systems and Societies. Today's all about biodiversity and conserving it. Um, and here's what I want you to get out of this video. There's a lot of reasons to conserve biodiversity. Um, some of these are really direct and easy to see, and some are indirect and not as easy to see. And ultimately, when we're trying to do this, there's a big difference between conservation and uh, preservation. So, the direct reasons, uh, the things that are easy to calculate, like you harvest some food and you split it up among everybody in your neighborhood, and everybody gets a certain amount of food, we can see the benefits of those plants in that situation. We get the cassava here, and everybody gets food, and we, that's very direct and easy to see. But a lot of stuff is indirect, and so indirect uh, are things that are hard to calculate, but we know help make our lives better. So keeping water quality good, or keeping the climate regulated, or improving the quality of soil, these are all indirect benefits of biodiversity, but they're very hard to quantify. So if you look at kind of uh, economic reasons to conserve biodiversity, food sources might top the list. And if you look at a single source of wheat, if something happens to that wheat, if the climate's wrong or the disease comes along, it's wiped out, it's gone, it's done. But if you have different kinds of wheat, then you can find the one that's right for that climate. And if you have different strains of wheat and disease gets one, you have another kind of wheat to come in and take its place. And so this is one way that, that we can directly use biodiversity, although in one crop, to our advantage, okay? And we have a ton of natural products. And these, okay, let's just look at a list real quick. You've got medicines, you've got cotton for our clothes, you have rubber for latex that we use in surgery, you have linen for clothing, you have um, silk, you have timber to build everything out of. And these are just a short list of things that we know we can use that we've discovered in nature. There's a ton of stuff that we might be able to use for our benefit that has yet to be discovered. And if we bulldoze it, we'll never get to discover it. Discover it. I'm sorry. And, and that brings me to the indirect economic benefits. So really the first one is sort of knowledge right um if the more we know the more we understand and the more we understand the more we can use that knowledge to solve problems like waste management or resource use and we love to explore it's a natural tendency for humans and because of that tendency because we've gone out to explore we've learned things and one of the things we've learned is that the predator prey relationship can be used in our advantage we can find insect predators that will kill invasive animals that are trying to kill our crops so this praying mantis is killing this fly that was killing our plants so it works in our benefit and it it turns out too that we've also learned through our explorations that there are plants and animals that act as monitors that will tell us if the air quality is dropping or the water quality is dropping. So there's this little organism called a water penny. And if you're taking a net through water and you find rocks and stuff, you turn it over. If you see a water penny, which is this thing on the bottom right that's round, if you see a water penny on a rock, that tells you the water's good. But if you go back the next time and it's not there, that tells you something's happened to the water and that tells you to be worried, okay? And then, what if you get an infection from a bacteria, from some sort of waste? Well, because we've explored the world, because we've learned about molds and funguses, we, fungi, sorry, we were able to discover penicillin, which helped us fight bacterial infections and save millions and millions of lives. And speaking of the, of, of the lives, what about the lives of the people that live in the forest? If we just mow down the forest for our own benefits, for our oil or for our cattle or for our timber, what about the people that live there? Can you imagine coming home and your home's been bulldozed for a strip mall? You've lived there for 50 years or your family's lived there for 50 years and it's just gone? What about if your family's lived there for 3,000 years and all of a sudden it's gone? Is that fair? But back here, where maybe we don't have to worry about that as quickly, we still use this. So we use this. We use nature all the time. We go out and, and we fill our soul with happiness. I mean, I know it sounds cheesy, but we, we, we represent it in our art. And we explore it when we hike and when we kayak. And, and we, we are uplifted when we're in nature. But I think... 
probably the most important reason to protect nature, to protect the biodiversity of the world, is because each organism on this planet has a right to exist. We call it a bio right. It means that, that a rhino is not important, more important than a human, which is not more important than a cactus. We're all equally important, okay? Why do I think humans have a big responsibility to fix all this stuff, though? Because we've messed it up. There's no doubt about it. So it's our job to fix the problem, okay? Now, the way we are going to fix this is one of two ways, conservation or preservation. And they're not the same thing. Conservation means uh, humans get to use this and we use it in a sustainable way so that, you know, for food or for shelter or for medicine, so that people can use it 100 years from now for food or for shelter or for medicine. And the first big American that is, this is Pichot, and he was a big advocate of conservation, using our resources wisely. But on the flip side, you have preservation. And this is basically saying, hey, this area hasn't been touched with by humans, so leave it be. Don't mess it up. Don't get in there. Don't use it. It has its own value and it's none of our business to get in there. And that's a harder one. That's a harder line to uh, to keep because people want that area for whatever reason. But this man, John Murr, who started the Sierra Club, who, start, who got Yosemite as a national park, he was a big advocate of preserving parts of the world just for itself without humans. Okay? Those two guys would argue quite a bit. They were friends, but they would argue quite a bit. So hopefully what you've gotten out of this video is that there's a lot of reasons to protect biodiversity. Some are direct, some are indirect. And there's two ways to do it, conservation and preservation. And we still have a lot of choices to make. Okay, I hope that made it all clear. If not, please let me know. Otherwise, peace out, homie. Honey Badger.